Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today we have episode number 26, and we are going to finally be wrapping up our position rankings with the top 10 centers um, of the upcoming NBA season. As always, again, we are going to be projecting a little bit into next season with our top 10 rankings. Um, We're also going to be reacting to the NBA schedule release, which came out since we've last recorded, get into some of the Christmas Day games, opening night games. Uh, rivalry week, which they did last year, and they're bringing back again and talk through some of those biggest matchups. Again, we got to go and talk through the James Harden saga because it continues to get deeper and deeper each and sing, each and every day there in Philly. The drama is never ending. Um, and lastly, we're going to finish up with some some blind rankings of NFL players and Hall of Famers as well. Um, that's going to be a nice little you no know, short TikTok video. So, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it as we always do. How are we doing today, Dan? Doing great, man. I am doing great. I'm excited. Let's talk about these centers, man. I feel like this list is going to be real interesting. It's not going to be the power forward one was kind of straightforward. Like, it wasn't really too much change up there. But this center is one. It could, it could be a little bit of our, – our list could be a little bit different here. Yeah, I think this is going to be the one that's closest to the point guard list and that our list at, at least were shaken up from each other. There's a lot of, of variance – like you said, shooting guard, small forward, and power forward, I feel like we're pretty cut and dry, especially once you get to, like, the top three or four guys and even a little bit before that. Like, everybody's kind of bunched up in the same tiers. Center, I think, like point guard, everybody is going to have different opinions on what they want out of their center or what makes a center great. Um, and so I'm interested to see how our list shakes out because I know of some guys that I probably have on my list that you might not have on your list at all and vice versa. Um, so I'm interested to see, uh, going to get the housekeeping out of the way as always. If you're on YouTube, like comment, subscribe to the channel, audio platform platforms, five-star review, um, drop a, a five-star rating for the channel, pre-download the show. It helps us out a ton. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and get right into the, the top 10 rankings. Um, uh, I think I went first last time on power forward. So I'm going to have you go first. Who is your number 10 center in the NBA going into next season? So my number 10 center was a little bit tough. Um, it was between two people. It was between Jared Allen and Miles Turner. Um, but I ultimately went with Miles Turner just because I feel like I, I do like what Jared Allen gives you on the defensive end. I feel like obviously they had a number one rated um defense last year. So obviously that's a big factor. But I also feel like Miles Turner can give you a little bit more offensively. He can space the floor, um, he'll give you a little bit more scoring. We'll still give you solid defense as well. And I, I think I'm factoring in the last playoff run with, from the Cavs into my rankings, too, just because it's like they got kind of bullied in the paint. Not kind of. They got bullied in the paint. Yeah, not kind of. They did. They got bullied. So it's like, yeah, in the regular season, you give me the number one defense. But come playoff time, I got two seven-footers on my team. And Mitch Robinson is out rebounding y'all, playing better defense, out hustling you guys. It's like, does it really translate to the playoffs? Like Jared Allen himself said the lights are a little bit too bright. So just me personally, I couldn't put a guy who the lights was too bright on my team. Mm -hmm. That's just me personally. Um, And I'm not even like the biggest Miles Turner guy in the world. You know what I mean? But I just feel like that that last playoff run kind of kind of was was the the tipping point for me as far as putting Miles Turner ahead of Jared Allen. Yeah, I went back and forth at number 10 as well. There's a couple of guys I feel like when I started making the list and I made my list from number one down because spoiler alert. Like, if you've been listening to the podcast, Jokic is going to be number one on both mm-hmm. of our list. <laughs> uh, so I just started with what I knew for certain and kind of worked my way backwards. Um, and the people that I had in mind when I was thinking when I got to 10 was, like, around, like, Jared Allen, Miles Turner, even, like, Valanchunas, like, was where I was thinking. And so when I got there for that last spot, I debated a lot between uh, Jared Allen and Miles Turner. And I had Jared Allen for a little bit, and I just kept thinking about it. Again, as high as I am on Tyrese Halliburton, I think it makes sense for me to also put Miles Turner here at 10 as well. Um, Again, like you said, the Cavs playoff series um, against the Knicks was shocking for both of us. I know we both had um, the Cavs, I think, coming out of that series, and they, like you said, got bullied in the paint. Um, Jared Allen did not have a good series. He had the quote, like you said, that he thought the lights were too bright. You know, there's a lot of inexperience on that team, so – 
it's also tough to gauge at the same time because obviously the Pacers didn't make the playoffs, but I think as a rim protector, Miles Turner provides a little bit more than Jared Allen. Um, not even just from like a box score perspective, I think he averages probably a, a more like a, almost a block more per game than Jared Allen does. Mm-hmm. Um, but also again, Jared Allen was playing with a top three candidate for defensive player of the year last year. You know, Miles Turner was pretty much heading up that their rim protection effort. So Jared Allen had a, like more support there um, as well. And then also the added benefit of Miles Turner being the floor spacer that he is, you know, for the last like three or four seasons or so, you're getting like four to four and a half threes a game from him um, on pretty good efficiency. This last year was honestly one of his most efficient um, in the NBA at over 37 percent, which for your big man is fantastic. And like Great. Right. Like we mentioned with the additions that they have in Obi Toppin and Bruce Brown and Halliburton again now getting it, you know, he's taking the steps. You see how he's been playing with the uh, with the FIBA team, with Team USA. Um, I know we're both really high on the Pacers. I think everybody in the organization is just going to benefit from there being a little bit of buzz around them. I think now there's really some expectations on them, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. Hopefully, in their case, is a good thing where they're kind of expected to be a playoff team this year. I think a lot of people have them as a playoff team. Um, so hopefully they play up to that standard. And if they do, uh, Miles Turner will be a big reason why. Cause like I said, he still is going to be their primary, um, you know, last line of defense at the rim. Um, and like has multiple, I don't, he hasn't averaged under two blocks a game in a season since 2017, 18. It's so like year in, year out, like you're getting an elite rim protector, and a floor spacer on the other end. Like you cannot ask for much more out of that kind of prototype big. It's um, literally like the dream big man for like 90% of teams, bro. It's like, right. that, that's why he was always in them rumors with the Lakers trying to get him to mm-hmm. play alongside Anthony Davis. Because can you imagine Anthony Davis and Miles Turner and he's able to space the floor as well as long as being like an elite rim protector. Like it's just, it's for in today's NBA, like it's just perfect. Yeah. So, um, that's why I ended up putting him at 10. Like I said, I went back and forth with Jared Allen a lot. I like, I've mentioned a ton of times on the show, like Jared Allen fits that new, the way that teams I think are starting to shift back to having a center who's just good at screen setting, rolling, rim protection, like getting back to the basics and fundamentals of quality big man play and going away from wanting unicorn type players a little bit. And Jared Allen, like, could almost be the face of that. Like he does all of those things at a good level. So like he'll always, I think, float around this range, like borderline top 10 at this position because of that. But I don't know if he'll ever get higher because again, he's kind of capped at that. And now playing with Evan Mobley, like he's going to start to get outshined in the defensive end. And I see, I honestly see a world where in a couple of years, if not sooner, like, they move off of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley now has time. He beefs up. He can kind of become the, the full-time five there and they bring in somebody else to play the four or vice versa. Just like kind of just move off Jared Allen and bring in somebody else um, and really let Evan Mobley kind of spread his wings even more defensively um, and continue to play that like Roma role and just bring in a different big body who may not command as much money as Jared Allen and divert that to a different position. They were saying that they were, well, not they were saying, but there was like kind of rumors that they might have done that this offseason with like trade Jared Allen just so he mm-hmm. can give uh, Evan Mobley the full room to develop and stuff like that. So 100% in the near future, I think that's definitely a move that they're going to make or this definitely a move that they're going to have to make, I feel like. Yeah. I also I didn't realize this until I was going through and making this list, but like I kind of just felt like Evan Mobley and it might just be like the size difference in terms of weight. Evan Mobley is technically like by listed height taller than Jared Allen too. Is there? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's just the fact that he's so skinny. Like yeah. So much skinnier. Like I view him as a power forward, but it. I mean, right. It makes sense. Yeah, I guess I think even if they move off of Jared Allen, I think it will always make sense for teams to have somebody else to like just be a bigger body. Yeah, for um, sure. Because like like the same thing that uh, like Memphis does with Jaron and Stephen Adams, like let Jaron be the Romer and just have a, a quality center who can, you know, kind of do that. So like, even if they keep Jaron Allen, I think it's a good decision, but Evan Mobley is so versatile defensively. And if he can just get a little bit stronger, um, they may feel more comfortable with kind of moving off of Jaron Allen and 
like I said, you, you then have more cap space to, you know, maybe try to find a better three, um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for Cleveland. So, yeah. So let's go on to, to number nine. Um, this is where I think the list is going to start to shake up for sure. Um, okay. Cause I don't think you even have my number nine guy on your list, but what do you have at, at number nine? Okay. okay. Interesting. Interesting. My number nine is Rudy Gobert. Um, oh, he did make your top 10. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. Uh, it's just, I could like, listen, I'm telling people in the podcast. Now, I don't like Rudy Gobert. I really, I really don't like, it's not many players that I just don't like. I try not to dislike players. I don't like Rudy Gobert. Like, it's just, I don't know, something about him. Not personally. No, let me not act like it's him the person. I don't know the guy. But, like, him on the basketball court is just, I think it was all the years of him winning defensive player of the years and and also come playoff time, him getting hunted. Like, to me, that just does like, it doesn't sit right with me. And I, I fully understand that the Jazz teams that he was on, it, he wasn't in the best positions because – had no they he had no good perimeter defenders around him. So I fully get it. But at the end of the day, you're the defensive player of the year. You getting hunted and getting exposed come playoff time. Like all the team has to do is go small ball. And now you're comp- you're a, like it's not the fact that like all right, let's say he's a defensive player of the year and then come playoff time it just drops down to an average defender. You go from defensive player to, to, of the year to a liability on unplayable. Defense. Like that to me that just it never felt right with me. Along with the fact that this man cannot catch the ball or make a layup, so it's like all of that. Never mind, take him off my list. I just talked. Yeah, about he's gone. <laughs> my number nine is Chet Holmgren. <laughs> he's out of here, bro. Get him out of here. I'm sorry, I don't care. Yo, I don't care, bro. Number nine, Chet Holmgren. Rudy <laughs> Gobert's <is> gone. <laughs> like I just, bro, it, I can't, bro. I can't. Yo. Do it. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I can't do it. Bro, this guy is like the stats and the accolades that he has is like the greatest defensive player ever. And he, I no, he's not. He's just not. I'm sorry. He's gone. <laughs> I can't Yo, do it. so so is Chet. Chet is now number nine on your list. Miles Turner nine. Chet ten. Get get get, get go bear out of here, bro. He's done. He's gone. I just took my survivor. I was trying to be nice. I was trying to like be unbiased. Bro, it, you it. said zero positive things about Go Bear. Like, <laughs> dude said, I got Go Bear at nine. And here's all the reasons why he's one of the worst. Of the <laughs> Bro, I couldn't think of, like, all right. Let me, all right, let me stop playing around. Okay. Go Bear, obviously, <clears throat> he's not a bum. I'm not, like, I told you, it's a, it's a little bit biased. I can admit that. I can admit when I'm biased for certain things. Um, At the end of the day, he is a, a good rim protector. The teams that he is on, it does help like he does elevate the team's defense. Like I'm not gonna say here act like this guy's just a, a flat out bum. Um, but maybe it's just to me, I sometimes I feel like I value versatility a little bit more than rim protection in certain situations. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So the fact that you could be an elite rim protector, but come playoff time, you are so bad on the perimeter and you're so bad at everything else that like that elite rim protection doesn't matter because all teams have to do is go small and then you're completely obsolete. So like that part of it is why he's kind of low on this list. And uh, like I said, along with the fact that you don't give me anything on offense, like nothing. Like I, th- I've seen this guy miss wide open layups before. Like he can't give me anything on offense. But <laughs> yeah, that, you go ahead. You maybe you could talk something good about Rudy Gobert. <laughs> okay, I got, I got Rudy at nine. Um, but uh, uh, like all of the drawbacks that you said are all very true. This man got played off the court by Terrence Mann. Terrence Mann effectively eliminated literally a three-time defensive player of the year for being able to play in a playoff series. Mm-hmm. I went in depth about it before on the podcast. Many people have had their arguments about it in person, on Twitter, whatever, about why the Jazz failed in that series and why they failed as a whole, really that whole era with him and Donovan Mitchell. And again, a lot of that is due to how they played defense. Everything was getting funneled to Rudy Gobert in the paint, but – it's not even funneled. It was just like everything got to Rudy Gobert in the paint. Literally. Nobody was getting stopped at, on the perimeter at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's two sides to that coin. But this is, I can't not put Rudy in the top 10 solely for the fact that he is always going to be like any team he's on. I think like the floor immediately is like a top 10 defense. Like it's not going to That's be true. any worse than that. 
Uh, last season, the Wolves were, I think, like the 20th best ranked defense in the, the NBA. If you exclude garbage time from this past season, that jumped up to eighth. So, granted, like you said, offensively, it definitely got better once they got rid of D'Angelo Russell and Barton Mike Conley. They had had their little pick and roll chemistry from Utah that kind of carried over. So, I mean, maybe that carries over again this year, but like I think all of that goes out the window because it's the Anthony Edwards show. I don't care what's going on as long as exactly. they give him the ball, <laughs> they'll be all right. Uh-huh. Um, but really, my concern is always going to be with another person that's going to be on this list, which is Cat, because the two of them playing together, the fit still is not there. It honestly kind of hurts the both of them because you end up in a similar position that you were in Utah where you have an extremely weak perimeter defender who can be attacked. And it's not Kat's fault. He was a, he was an all star, all NBA center before you traded for Gobert. Like Mm. y'all had one on the roster and then sent five first round picks and a bunch of young talent over to Utah to get another center and put your center. Who's never played power forward since he's been in the league to have to play with another center who also forces him on the wing like he can't play the paint because that's Gobert is historically good at like mm. not I'm not even saying historically like in his career like historically like one of the best rim defenders in NBA history and it's very crazy to say this but like he's he's I think he's gonna go to the Hall of Fame like he's probably it's a disgusting. lot to go to the Hall of Fame bro. you know the reason why another reason why I don't like Gobert I'm sorry I'm being so negative but it's like you're just elite rim protector. All right, you can't go. You can't go in the perimeter. Cool. You're not versatile. Cool. Are you gonna stop a big for me? Are you gonna like give me some stops? I watch Jokic eat this man's food. Granted, it's Jokic. Like he's gonna right. he destroy the AD. So I'm not sitting here acting like he's supposed to lock him up. But you remember that time years ago when Ben Simmons was mad at Rudy Gobert and he gave him 42 points. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. bro. Like, can you at least? Slow a center down. Can you slow somebody down? Like, I, or give them something on the other end. That's what I'm like, bro. That's what I'm like. To me, it just doesn't make sense. Like, my deep hoy can only like block shots from people driving to the paint. Like, he can't even like really defend well. You know what I'm saying? Like, he can't mm-hmm. really stop bigs, but then also is a liability on the perimeter. You yeah, know, nah, he's off my list, bro. I'm done. He's good. <laughs> but I'm good, when I look at people who have. Up here. <laughs> <laughs> People who have won defensive player of the year three or more times. There's only four of them in NBA history. It's Dwight Howard, Rudy Gobert, Dikembe Mutombo, and Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace and Mutombo obviously are already in the Hall of Fame. Um, I'm pretty – Mutombo is in the Hall of Fame, right? I'm not tripping. He should be if he's um, not. He should be. Uh, and then Dwight Howard also should be in the Hall of Fame as well. So, like, Gobert is there. And even if you go down to guys who won it twice – it's Kawhi going to be in the Hall of Fame. Alonzo Mourning in the Hall of Fame. Dennis Rodman, for sure, also in the Hall of Fame. Hakeem in the Hall Kawhi of Fame. Kawhi won it twice? Yeah. Damn. Um, and then Mark Eaton and City Moncrief, who off the top of my head, I'm not sure about either of them, but both of them are iconic players of their era. So it's like mm. that alone is probably going to get Rudy Gobert into the Hall of Fame because love it or hate it, he is a generational Rim protector. Ew, man. That's so gross. Like, it, it's sick because it's so true. Like, if you put his accolades and stats on, like, bam, that's a lot, Hall of Famer or something. Like, if, just if his name, if he wasn't Rudy Gobert, just give those accolades to mm-hmm. anyone else. It's a lot, Hall of Famer. So it's just, oh, it's so gross. It is so gross. I, I just hope that people don't look back, like, 20 years from now and, like, look back on this era and be like, why doesn't people talk more about Rudy Gobert? Like, look at that stats. He's a three-time deep boy. Like, he's probably the greatest defensive player ever. Like, stop, bro. All right. And I remember yeah. he said he would lock up Shaq. Stop it, bro. Stop. He just it. like he's just <laughs> unlikable, bro. I'm sorry, Rudy Gobert. He, bro, he start. He brought COVID to the NBA. That's what. <laughs> what I'm changing my list, bro. He brought knows. COVID to the league. Gave Donovan Mitchell COVID. Like, bro, thought it was a game out here. Touched. Touching all the microphones <laughs> after his press conference and really shut the NBA down. Yeah, so Chet for me is number nine because he did not start COVID in the <laughs> NBA. That's all I need. I don't need nothing else. I don't need stats. That's it. Uh, yeah. Look, 
at the end of the day, his offense is – it is what it is. All Bro can do is dunk the ball. <laughs> if it's fed to him in the dunker spot, that's it. You're not getting no post moves, really. It's no, there's no like zero offensive bag work. In and any he's over here way, working on his threes. Form. You're over here working on your three pointer, bro. You don't even can't even catch the ball and make a layup, but let's practice shooting threes. Oh, I blame Steph. <laughs> uh, yeah, he he also be he be leading the league in um screen assists too. He be up there in screen assists. You know his teammate grade in two K. Yeah, I'm about, say, yeah. <laughs> I'm about to say when I think of screen assists, I think of teammate grade. That's what I think of. He, he grinding them badges. That's, that's the problem. I'm dead. He trying to get um, that rebounding grand bad. That's what he trying to get. Uh, but yeah, look, that's why I got Rudy at nine. I got him ahead of Miles Turner solely because, like I said, the. His absolute floor for teams he's on is going to be like a top 10 defense. And like that speaks volume just to how good his rim protection is. Great screener, great rim protector, not a good defender in space, like a horrible defender in space. <laughs> and it leaves very little to provide on offense if you're not setting the screen and grabbing offensive rebound or literally catching the ball within arm space of the basket literally that is all he's got and so from that perspective fantastic (laughs) problem is keeps getting exposed and i really do not know if him and cat can coexist i don't think so like it i don't what we saw from cat as a four and i like i don't even blame him you're asking a seven footer to go look at who plays the four nightly in right, that's NBA what I'm, exactly. It's not these big seven footers anymore. Right, these big low seven footers. Okay, cat. Here's Katie. <laughs> like what? What, is, what? what can he do? What can he do with that? Like you can't even ask. Like you can't blame him at all. What can he do with that? That's not what if, he was supposed to do. If they match up against the Suns right now, who is Cat guarding? Because go, go, right, he, he, he literally can't guard on Aiden. What, What's up? Because you're gonna put all right. You put McDaniel's on uh, KD. One of them, some you can't put them on a guard, like it's it's not gonna work. <laughs> one of them would have to come off the bench, seriously. Like, one of them would legitimately have to come off the bench. There's no, like you said, he cannot guard anyone else but Aiden, and Rudy has to guard Aiden. So, it's like one of them is going to have to come off the bench, right? Because you can't put Rudy on someone of the people on a, on a perimeter player. Can like, you, can you imagine Rudy, Rudy on Catherine Durant? Bro, Full Kevin Durant is going for 70 <laughs> every single game. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, like, yeah. you could say that about a lot of teams in the league. Same thing with, like, the Celtics at this point. Like, even before like, – let me go to last year before they got Chris Stapps. It's like you got Tatum at the four, Horford at the five. It's like who, who's cat guarding in this situation? Like, like you said, somebody's going to have to come off the bench, and then it's like is your max contract – former All-NBA, All-Star, homegrown center about to come off the bench? Or the guy that you traded five first-round picks for about to come off the bench? Yeah. It's a lose-lose situation. Yeah, that's bad. And you know who really losing is Anthony Edwards because it's his time. And y'all messing it up. They messing up his timeline, man. That Rudy Gobert trade set them back, bro. You see what he doing in, with Team USA, bro. He is the guy. Steve Kerr said he is undoubtedly the guy. I've seen that. I've like, seen come that. on, bro. That's his young MJ right there. Y'all ruining his time, bro. That's all. Matter of fact, good job. Because when he asked y'all to come to the Lakers, yeah. don't look at me. <laughs> don't look at me. Y'all messed it up. When he asked y'all to come to the Lakers, don't be blaming yourselves. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So, I'm Chat at nine. My number eight is Brooke Lopez. Okay. So, um, so, basically, yeah. Brooke Lopez is going to give you elite rim protection, but then also give you <laughs> at least shooting on offense. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That's the third splash, bro. Splash Mountain right there. Splash <laughs> Mountain. That's such a good name for him because I did not know he owns a house on Disney's property. Yeah. Like, yeah. he literally is a Disney fan to the point that he bought a crib at Disney World. <laughs> That's what I would do if I was rich. I'd just be doing stuff. Like, just doing whatever I want if I was rich. How do you even but, find that? Like, you just, you got to have a real estate agent. You're just like, yeah, they got anything at Disney? Like, just for facts. sale? <laughs> you know how much you got to love Disney to do that? Like you gotta it's absolutely no, it's no love way. Disney. Like, cause I would get sick of it. Even if I had kids and they love Disney, nah, bro. I'm not yeah. living at <laughs> Disney World. Yeah, that's crazy. But yeah, um, Brooke Lopez, obviously, 
him along with him and Giannis, the Bucks are going to be a great defensive team every single year. So that goes into it. But Brook Lopez is, like you said, like we talked about, he's the bigger body on that team. He's the guy that really clogs stuff up in the paint and allows Giannis to be that roamer, be that weak side defender or, or help defender. And then, honestly, the main reason why I have him over a guy like Gobert is because, like we said, he's going to give me elite rim protection. He's going to be in a deep boy conversations, and he's also going to give me great shooting on offense. He's going to give me something on offense. Like right. People forget Brook Lopez really used to be a back-to-the-basket, post-move, back-you-down center. All-time he, leading scorer in Nets history with a, with a deep post-back. Literally. And they just and, abandoned it. And, yeah, right, and he did not shoot at all. Then he's like, "Oh, the game is changing. Let me not get, <laughs> let me not get kicked out of the league, right? And let me like evolve. So like, all credit to Brook Lopez in that aspect, evolving his game and prolonging his career, basically. And oh, no, oh, no. get a bag. Brook Lopez, this is like Brook Lopez attempted. This is like twenty eight threes in the first. This is like one, two, three, four, five, six. This is like what eight seasons of his career." And then the very or and then the very next season, this doesn't even look real. 2015, 16, he attempted 14 threes. The next season he attempted 387. <laughs> what? How do you how do you die? Right, that doesn't make sense because it's no gradual like increase. At 34% to almost 35. Like but- just so flip the switch like that, bro. bro. There's no excuse for no for people that's not being able to shoot free throws or like get like a corner three, bro. I'm sorry. Because if Brooke Lobos could just Flipped the switch and out of nowhere next season, you know what? I shot. He, he bought the VC. Year. He bought the VC in the off season. He, he finally, had that. He was just had not that. trying to touch the three point attribute. That's what it was. Do say, you know, I shot fourteen last year. I'm getting up three hundred of these things. <laughs> what? Okay. That is, how does that? How does that happen? He was how, he was a lethal shooter or something. There's no way. There's and no that way. was that was his last year in Brooklyn. That's crazy. But yeah, shout out to Brook Lopez. Yeah, he got my respect, bro. Because it, it prolonged his career, allow him to get paid even more. Like mm-hmm. it was, it was a real smart move by him, definitely. All right, D- did all of that, and then coming off of back surgery, arguably is playing some of the best impactful basketball of his career. Like you said already, like the rim protection is elite. He off of back surgery, he put up the most blocks per game he has in his career at age. Back surgery at age 34. Yes, like, these are – it's like a death sentence for an NBA player. That's the end mm-hmm. of your career. A seven-footer at that? Right, and came back and had a defensive player of the year finalist season. Um, hands down is probably a top three drop coverage defender um, yeah. in the NBA. He plays that so well. And, again, that goes hand-in-hand with Giannis being able to be the help roamer as he is. is they have so much confidence – especially in him and Drew playing any type of screen actions um, because of how aggressive Drew is on the ball and how much they know that Brooke Lopez can cover them on the backside as that drop, you know, defender there. So um, he's almost like in terms of overall impact, I would say he's like Miles Turner, just like uh, a little bit like literally. Yeah, literally. Um, yeah, I think he just – he provides more on the defensive end from a – like I said, the drop coverage, which is like what Boonholzer loved to play all, all his time in Milwaukee, um, did that at an extremely elite level, has the box to show for as well as just the general uh, rim deterrent stats. Um, the defensive rating is always going to be high because you have him and Giannis and Drew playing at the same time. So obviously he benefits from that. I'm not going to take that away from him. Um, and then, like you said, he's giving you 16 a night on like 37, 38% from three. Like he is splash mountain. <laughs> he literally is a seven foot elite rim protector who can really strap up. <laughs> like, um, he's the perfect. That's why when we always did those like drafts and we drafting a role player and I'm looking for a center, I'm like, bro, Brooke Lopez is the perfect role playing center. Yep. Like, what what more can I ask? Like like yeah, like we just said the same thing with Miles Turner. He's literally just an upgraded version of that. Yeah, so. he <clears throat> he's got it, and he uh, they're very lucky to have kept him in Milwaukee. Because on top of all of that, like, could you think like, is there a better big to pair with Giannis? Because like, there's Not very better. limited no. number. Like right, like you maybe could fit like him, Miles Turner, Miles Turner, <laughs> and then like you're getting to like crazy good people like. 
Jokic, Cal, you have to pair another star who's like yeah. so versatile that they could pull it off, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, Cat wouldn't be bad. I right, because you just you need like the, the, the spacing. Yeah. Um, but it's like of the handful of guys that like they could really work, they got one of the best ones and arguably the best defender out of that group too. Yeah. Um, so Brook Lopez is, like you said, he definitely – revived his career by going and <laughs> turning that switch on to, to get to the three ball. So we both have him at eight. I am certain now that the list is about to change from this point forward. Cause well, I guess we already have the difference cause you took Gobert out. Um, but but yeah, who, do you you have, who do you have at, at seven on your list? Um, at seven, I have Nick Claxton. Um, Dang, I got Nick Claxton at seven too. Bro. It's like, it's just, Honestly, the only reason why I have him at seven is because he's more, like I said, he's more versatile than I feel like the guys below him. He's and crazy more versatile. Though. That's like, what I'm saying. It's a big leap. Honestly, if I'm being completely honest with you, I was thinking about putting six, but I just felt like the guy at six, spoiler alert, just made an all NBA. That would have been kind of crazy. But yeah. I mean, if I'm looking for, if I'm thinking about what do I want from my center? The guy at six doesn't give me. I'll talk more about him later, but it doesn't really give me what me personally what I would want from my center, unless uh, you're Jokic. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So, but like Nick Claxton, I just feel like, like I said, the only reason why I put him ahead of the guys below him is because he's way more versatile than those guys. Which mm-hmm. versatility is key. I feel like as far as defensively in, in the NBA in general, I just feel like being versatile. And being able to spl- to defend different players, being able to defend different positions is way more. I'd say it's a, I'd say it's slightly more important than just flat out rim protection, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, that's why I have Nick Claxton at seven over some of these other guys. I'm about to throw a lot of stats out really quick because I am, I think Nick Claxton, like I'm looking at this list when I think of the best defenders, he might really be the third best defender on this list, third best defensive center in the NBA. And he's mm-hmm. also, he, he's what, like, 22 24 24 um but in terms of defensive field goal percentage on all two pointers he was third in the league only behind Chris Stapps and then Jaron who obviously won defensive player of the year he had this he was tied for um the second best defensive field goal percentage um in the league among centers um with Jaron who the NBA has classified as like forward and center, but again, tied with the defensive player of the year in that stat as well. He also only had 10 less combined steals and blocks than Jaron Jackson did. And he's clear. They both, he's clearly second. Like it was a big gap between two and three. Um, And like you said about versatility, um, the NBA will track isolation plays as well. He defended, 202 isos again this is based on nba's tracking stats which is a little bit different than like second spectrum or some of the other people that do some of the other advanced analytics with cameras um but based on the nba's data right he defended 202 isolations which is 50 more than the next closest player in the league and only gave up 0.79 points per possession which is the third most in the nba among i think among centers so like, and the next closest guy I think was like Al Horford, like I said, at like 150. So defended 50 more isolations than him and was giving up less than a point per possession. Um, Damn. <laughs> and a lot of this, like before the KD trade happened and they like KD and Kyrie mm-hmm. trade, like mm-hmm. he was in defensive player of the year talks mm-hmm. for this reason. Um, and like even just at his raw counting stats, like a steal a night and two and a half blocks. And he had the moments, too, if you care about that, like he was going at it with Embiid in the regular season. Um, and when I'm thinking about next year, right, like he was this good on defense. And his team got significantly better defensively around him. Like they went not necessarily that saying that like. The people that were there, is like particularly in like KD and Kyrie, are like these horrible defenders. It's more about like, who they brought in, right? Like sure. you went from KD and Kyrie to now you have Mikael Bridges 
Dorian Finney-Smith and Cam Johnson all out there as perimeter defenders. And we already just talked about how you are versatile. Like there's, it's not like a unwilling switch. Like if Nick Claxton gets out on the Island, like you live with that. You might be okay with it. Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you trust him and his athleticism, but also know that he has a recovery to get to the rim. Somebody gets past him and can test shots, get blocks from behind. Um, I think Nick Claxton is going to be a perennial all defensive guy. Like could be a, like if he plays, you know, like 15 seasons might finish with like seven, eight, nine, all defensive teams. Like I really think he can be that good on the defensive side of the ball. Um, while also being again, like a quality screen and role player, um, and has the athleticism that he utilizes on the defensive end to also be, you know, a good finisher on the offensive side of the ball as well. So I think Nick Claxton is going to have probably an even better defensive season um, this upcoming year with the better total team Nets defense around him. So I'm really, really high on Nick Claxton. Like you, I think I try. I really wrestled with putting him up higher, but like it, it felt too crazy to put him above any of the people in front of him. But Nick Claxton is like that defensively. And like he's going to be in deep boy talks for years to come. He is legitimately that good. If he all did not watch Nick Claxton or the Nets last year, even after, you know, like with the KD and Kyrie trades, like tune into a couple of Nets games this year and just watch how he moves on the defensive side of the ball, not just as a rim protector, like watch him in space. If he gets switched onto a guard or a wing, like he's very comfortable using his length and athleticism out there. So uh, I'll surprise you had him that high too. I didn't know if you if you were hip, but no, nah, yeah. I knew he because uh, I'm just saying. Like I said, and I I guess this is gonna turn to his own question. Like I like versatility on defense. Like that's why I like Bam. I just didn't like the fact that he wasn't aggressive offensively, but mm-hmm. defensively, like he I I love Bam. You know what I mean? Just because it's one thing to be a, re, uh, a just a good rim protector. We just talked about it with Rudy Gobert. You could be an elite rim protector, but if if we can get you in a switch and you're just done or like they can get you on an island and you're just done or it's like you can't guard literally anybody who knows how to dribble at all like you're just done for like anthony davis i'd say i'd say bam is more versatile to anthony davis as far as being being able to guard the perimeter but anthony davis if he gets switched onto a guard or onto a wing or whatever he can hold his own his right. own for a center you know what i mean mm-hmm. so like nick claxon he can do that in an elite level like he's gonna be fine on the perimeter you know what right. so that's the only reason why, because we talked about it with Brooke Lopez. I, I, it was between, like, I thought about it with Brooke real quick, but then I was like, all right, I like the versatility with Nick Claxton. And then with the guy at number six, which is Sabonis, I'll just bring it up now. I just, um, I don't know. Just the fact that he made all NBA, it, it would have been, it would have been a little bit too tough. Yeah. Way too tough. But, um, what, what I was going to ask you, are, like, are you in the same boat with me? Like, do you like, do you value versatility more than rim protection? Um, I think if you can really be that versatile, like to the guys on this list who are super versatile like that with guys like Nick Claxton or Bam or AD, like that I do value just more than pure rim protector, even if you're not as good of a rim protector, like Bam is not the same level as rim protector, some of the guys that we already list, but like his versatility is just full on defensive impact to me is like, like so far ahead of some of those guys who are phenomenal defenders he just is really that good and is uh, to like what like a top at worst like a top five defender in the league but like I probably would put him higher than that um so yeah I think if if you're really that versatile then like I don't even care if you're an average rim protector because that that just gives your defense so many more options and like can bail you out of so many more situations Versus if you have a guy like Rudy, who is like, if we have to switch this, like it's a bucket, like you just, you're just giving yeah. up points. Mm-hmm. Oh. All right. Yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. Talk, talk about, talk about Sabonis at six. So yeah, I I have Sabonis six. Um, Now Sabonis, his case is a little bit interesting. Cause yes, he just made, um what was it? 13 all in third team, all NBA. Um, he was just was an all star, also a starter, I believe. Like he had a really good regular season, mm-hmm. but like we've seen in the playoff time, the the way he plays, I feel like doesn't translate the best in the postseason. Like mm-hmm. he's not a great shooter, 
So, I mean, I'm not going to say that. I mean, at least in the playoffs, he wasn't a great shooter. So, he didn't. He wasn't play. even a willing shooter. Like, he was, like, passing the shoot? shots yeah. up. Like, he didn't shoot them. Like, they were sagging off of him, like, completely. Kawhi like, Looney is open. in the paint. He's yeah. standing at the mid-range wide open and, like, looking around to do a dribble handoff. Right. So, the, just the way I see it, if you're not going to space the floor offensively, and then you're also not going to be a great defender. What are you really giving me? Because, I mean, I understand he can post up. He can get his, like, his tough buckets. But come playoff time, like we've seen, that kind of got neutralized. So it's like, at what, like, what are you really giving me? You know what I mean? Like, his, his, just, his game didn't really translate well in the postseason. And it kind of got exposed a little bit in that Warrior series. So, I like, I understand he made all NBA, but like, I just, it was no way I could put him any higher, especially with the guy I had at five, just because I went, I, I thought about it for a second, but at least come postseason, the guy I have at five will give me something offensively. And they're both, they're both giving me nothing on defense. So at least, like, let me get the guy that can give me something on offense or at least space the floor, if that makes any sense. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I have him at number six, but I, there's no way I could put him any higher than that. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have our five and six flipped because my number six is cat. Yeah. Um, and if we were just talking purely in a vacuum, pick a player, I would take Carl Anthony Towns over Sabonis. Like the talent level is, I would say like a good step higher. Like cat is one of the best offensive bigs we've ever seen. Like defense, like I said, is, Leaves a lot to be desired, but Sabonis also is not this fantastic defender either. Exactly. Um, and definitely not from a rim protection standpoint. But I only have Cat behind him for a lot of the same reasons why I talked about with Gobert. I don't like the fit between the two of them. I think that puts Cat in a very bad spot to have to be a, like a negative on defense. Like where if he was just playing the five by himself, like he could hold his own and like what he's giving on the offensive end could negate if he was even being a negative defender or just if he could just be a decent defender. But it's like you're now asking him to guard on the perimeter if Gobert is on the court. It's where it's like that's so out of his – like what he's really – you're asking him to do something right. he's not capable of doing, which is really unfair to him. But mm -hmm. like how we're ranking them is, again, like basing how they're – going to perform into next season and like as long as Rudy Gobert is there I think they're capping what Cat's performance can be it's like you're limiting his options as a big by playing him against a big who is so limited on both sides of the floor like he can only do very particular things on the defensive side and the offensive side which means that Cat is always forced to play on the perimeter on both sides of the ball yeah. um uh, on top of the fact that, like, uh, both of these guys, like Sabonis and Cat, have had their issues in the playoffs as well. Like, we can't overlook Carl Anthony Towns' continued foul trouble in the postseason. Yeah, that um, was so weird. I, that, I don't know. That part never made sense to me. He's and it be, it's out. the dumbest fouls. Like, it's Stupid the fouls foul. that, like, the commentators, like, after it happened, is like, you can't do that. And it's like, yeah, bro, like. How many times is this going to happen in multiple playoff games that you have to realize, like, you're too valuable. You carry too much of the weight of this team's offense to be fouling out consistently. He did, Bro, he was in the playing game with the Lakers, killing us. Like, he was playing great. Foul trouble, foul trouble. And after every foul, he's... I don't know what happened. Like, like you bro, didn't you, just hack somebody. You just smacked this guy in the face. Like, what are you right. talking about? And it's just dumb fouls. Like, to me, that just that don't make sense. It's just right. so stupid. So the, the both of them definitely have, have had their struggles in the playoffs. You, know, you just highlighted a lot about um, Sabonis' struggles in the, you know, this the first round series. Uh, last year against Golden State, the inability to take the shots, as well as just even when he did shoot them, was not shooting them at a good percentage. Um, so the both of them have their playoff struggles, but I'm giving Sabonis the edge almost purely because Cat is in such a – bad situation okay that makes sense i because i looked at it from just like i'd just rather have cat but not the way you explain it makes a lot of sense so. that's if, if we were just looking purely off talent like this was like a 
you know, a draft, put a team together, whatever. No, like, all right. I'm taking Cat over Sabonis probably 10 times out of 10. Mm-hmm. That's again just off of the talent, but he's he's getting held back, bro. He's getting held back by that fit. No, and it's crazy because, like, not to go too off topic, but like, I really think the Timberwolves are still going to make it work. And that's going to be so much off of the back of Anthony Edwards. Mm-hmm. But this whole time in this whole season, I'm always going to imagine what it would be like if they just did not trade for Gobert and just like kept their picks. Imagine if they just <laughs> natively drafted Walker Kessler. Yeah. Instead of giving up all those picks for Gobert, and then you could move Walker and picks for whatever. Like, it's just within so many different options for them now that they see that Anthony Edwards literally is like on a crazy superstar trajectory and it's not like years away. It could be here now. Mm-hmm. It's like now y'all's you know, hands are tied to this, it, to really this three center room too, when you include Nas Reed, who also would fit so much better next to Carl Anthony Towns than Rudy Gobert, but you can't not play the man you paid or you traded five first round picks and are given, you know, a nine figure contract to. And he's untradeable. Like you can't trade that. You cannot trade Rudy Gobert. You gave up too much and you're not going to get nearly the same amount of compensation that you gave for it. Right. Whoever, whatever Danny Ainge was doing and talking to the Timberwolves GM about like, Basically, just baited him crazy, oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> acting like he, they were blowing his phone up for Rudy, so that they will overpay. That is, I really think it's going to go down as one of the craziest fleeces in NBA history. Like, bro, five first round picks, and one season later, we are talking about you cannot start him in your next. Your you can't start him and the second best player on your roster at the same time. And then the Jazz get his replacement. Right. <laughs> in right. the first year, Walker Kessler as a rookie has more blocks. It's crazy, bro. That trade is so dumb, bro. It's it's, it's, those, those, those are the funniest trades. Like, when it happens in the moment, everyone's like, bro, what are y'all doing? Like, how can – I'm not an NFL GM. How can I know in the moment that that's a stupid trade along with everybody else and it still goes down and you still do it? Like, to me, that doesn't make sense, bro. It, it really felt like a panic move, like – they get into the series with the Grizzlies. They, I don't even want to necessarily say they honestly could have won the series because both teams had opportunities to win the series, and it just was like, who's gonna who's gonna blow it? Because <laughs> like yeah, they were blowing y'all were going yeah, back teams. and forth with wild runs, blowing leads, and just so happened that the Wolves lost, and it felt like they saw how close they were, and were like, we got to make the move now, and just went out and got Gobert. When it's like, but if y'all would have just let it, if y'all would have just let it be. That bro, y'all could have just left the roster as is, and Anthony Edwards would be the same player he's about to come into this season as, and that's probably a better team, bro. Yeah, but who knows? Like, and it's like, bro, if y'all was gonna make a move, you could have just waited. Like, who knows what could have happened? Let's just say Katie asked out. You never make the Rudy Gobert trade. Katie asked out. You have all them picks. You possibly could pair Anthony Edwards and KD. Like, bro, you right. just, like the the move was never. Even if you were a piece away, like they were like legitimately like, if we get another superstar, we're going to win the championship. That move was never Rudy Gobert. He was never the piece. He's not the piece for anybody. Like, like genuinely, what team right now is the perfect situation for Rudy Gobert? Like right now. Like, like um, I, I can't think of one right now off the top of my head. Uh, He, I, I literally, to- I'm just trying to think of teams that have Four players who can all space the floor. <laughs> That's all you need. Like, spacing. Uh, like Boston, <laughs> but like, <laughs> why? That's what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't make sense. There's no team where it makes sense. The the Warriors? I don't know. Like, just take away like money, take away all that stuff. Like, I just I don't know. I don't know a team that makes sense. Like the only thing I'm thinking yeah. is the Warriors. Like that's it, just because they're already small. They got some shooting. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure. The, I'm sure the Suns would rather have Gobert than Aiden. They need defense. I don't know. Hey, Aiden been working for the the Bahamas team in FIBA. I am him, him and Buddy Hield and I know Eric Gordon played for the Bahama team too. He been he been working. That. So I saw him. Yeah, I saw him get that dunk. That's what I see. DeAndre Aiden was like. Team leader, like stepping up, like nah, don't quit, don't quit. So I better see this same energy this year, bro. 
Facts. Yeah, that's crazy. But uh, all right. So so I got some bonus six and cat mm-hmm. five. You got cat six and bonus five. Um, I think the these one through four is we're probably gonna have the same. It's thing. probably gonna be the same, but there's still a lot to talk about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I at, got you. At four, I'm assuming we probably both have Bam. Yep, one hundred percent. I, bro, wholeheartedly wish there was a way I could like really logically find a way to get him higher on this list. Because in terms of overall impact, to me, what I saw from him this past postseason run, it is in the same tier as, like, let me not say the same tier as AD, but it is not that far off, bro. You're saying what Bam's impact to the Heat specifically versus yes. AD's impact to the Lakers specifically. Right. Like, the, like you said, his biggest knock was always – the defensive impact is like always there as an undersized guy is really manning, you know, the heart and soul of that defense, but it always just the inconsistency on the offensive side of the ball. This playoff run, he really was stepping up like just the, just the aggression on the offensive side of the ball. And then especially on the nights where he was getting aggressive and the shots were falling, like he was looking, I mean, like, again, the defense is always going to be there, but he, at, overall as a player, he looked, elite like and there were moments where he was the best player for the heat not jimmy butler throughout their playoff run because of the impact that he was providing on both sides of the ball don't don't forget too he was he was facilitating a lot as well like it wasn't just his scoring like he was getting the like he was finding cutters he was finding shooters like he was like commanding the offense like on the offensive side of the ball so it wasn't just his scoring either so he he had a, a really good playoff run and this playoff run specifically, like you said, it just made me look at him in a different light because he's all he always was like inconsistent offensively. It always was like, or in, in many was the fact that he wasn't aggressive. That's really what it was. That's he yeah. Just, he he wasn't really, being aggressive. He would finish games with like single digit shot attempts, and it's like that, bro. That can't happen on a team like this, bro. Right. Like, you have to be a part of it. And when he was needed to step up many different times in the postseason. We saw that from him, and even in just his raw counting stats this year, like this was the first year that he put up over 20 a night um, with nine rebounds, three assists, um, and a steal and a block. He might – him and AD, I think, are right there with each other in terms of versatility. I think Anthony Davis probably edges him out solely because of his rim protection. Mm -hmm. Um, But like we touched on earlier in terms of how – much versatility matters especially in today's nba bam is like almost the blueprint like for what you would want out of Mm -hmm. a versatile big and like the fact that he's doing all of this at six nine like he is so much better than i feel like some people give him credit for um and i know it's because he hasn't won a defensive player of the year yet I I don't know if he never even necessarily ever will like, because we keep talking, like even as we've gone through some of these lists, like there's so many different guys that I've listed as like, they're going to be perennial, all defensive guys. Like a lot of those guys are going to win defensive player of the year awards. Like, I don't know. A band could very possibly go his whole career, just not get one, even though he's been close and in that conversation every single year, but that speaks to how much of an impact he has, even though his counting stats, just the raw counting stats are not that crazy. Like, less than a block a game, one seal a game is not, like, crazy. Like, oh, my gosh, Jaron Jackson is giving you three blocks a night. But it's like if you watch them you play, watch mm-hmm. right, if you watch them play how much he does um, at all three levels of the court on the defensive side of the ball um, is is special. And he's one of the best in the league um, at being that versatile on the defensive side of the ball. So I just – the gap between – him and AD, like AD, I think is still above him, but it is not as far as I feel like it may seem to some people. I just think AD's, uh, like the reason why I think people view it, view that gap being so large is because AD's ceiling is so much higher offensively, at least. Like, yeah, AD's ceiling yeah. is like there's nights when he's really on and he's aggressive and the, the middies falling, the jumpers falling. 
Like, he looks like the best player on the planet some nights. Like, Bam, even when he's playing his best, he never looks like the best player on the planet. So, like, AD's ceiling is just a little bit – or is a lot higher offensively. That's why I feel like people think that the gap is so large. But I definitely see what you're saying because, especially in this last – this postseason run, I mean, they're both second options on the team. So, it's not like they have – one has way more opportunity than the other. It's mm-hmm. so like they both had – a great impact on their respective teams. And, like, I mean, Bam's team made it to the finals. 80s team, they made it far. Like, bro, like, it's it's close as far as just straight-up impact. It definitely is close for sure. So, um, so yeah, this uh one through three is probably all the same. But we can right. talk about it a little bit because I got 83. Uh, Should have been 82. Let, let's talk about that. <laughs> I've, I've been waiting all episode to get to this exact spot in the list. Because, look, I'm, I'm going to let y'all know right now. We don't got nothing to say about Jokic. If y'all want to yeah. hear about Jokic, yeah. go, back, go back to when we were doing episodes as the postseason was going on. That'll tell you all you need to know about Jokic. He's on mm. top almost – he might be a top 15 player all time right now. You don't got to yeah. say much more. Y'all know what Jokic is. But let's talk about Joel and B. <laughs> because I, as I literally have it here on this list, I said three – Anthony Davis, two Joel Embiid, and in all caps next to it, it says Bear Lee. <laughs> Bear Lee, bro. Cause I it talking about it today on first take, doing the whole, you know, what's going on with James Harden and the Sixers. How much of this can Embiid take? And as I'm watching it, I'm like, again, bro, when are we like gonna point the finger? At the guy who's been on all these teams with all this talent, and they just can't get over the hump, bro. Like, at some point, to continue, and, like, injuries, I get it, I understand, bro. But, like, look, like, I, I, I'm i never going to have to feel like need, the need to point to anything else other than game six against the Boston series. I feel like sums it up so well. When it's all right there for you, what do we see from Joel Embiid and James Harden? It take James Harden out. What do we see from Joel Embiid? When it, the game is re- the chance to go to the conference finals, to be the only MVP who's never made it to the conference finals, to finally get that scrubbed off, even though you finally got, you know, you just got your MVP, but now they're going to hold that over your head for a whole other year because you couldn't get it done. You could have wiped that all away in five minutes and you didn't score the basketball in the game where Jason Tatum could not put the ball in the hoop for 44 of the 48 minutes. He didn't even look like he wanted the basketball, let alone scoring the basketball. I, I I can't. So I AD A or Embiid is at two, and when I tell you, like, bro, if y'all, if y'all can't see me if y'all are listening, but it is like so close, so close to being the other way around, because I, bro, the playoff production when we are at this like. At this point, like, this is just the centers list, but all three of these guys are, like, some of the top players in the league. So, like, y'all are on a different – y'all are getting graded differently (laughs) than Mm -hmm. some of the other people on this list, right? So, if you're going to be that good, in the regular season, you put up 33 points a game, 10 rebounds, like, almost two blocks, a steal a night, great. You cannot go into the postseason and have these performances year in and year out, bro. It cannot happen. Yeah. 20 points. And then, all right, the first series, he got, like, doubled like crazy um, against the Nets. So that was a sweep anyway. We saw what happened in the Boston series. Like, just it, it cannot happen. And it's continually happened every single year. They, like, sputter out in the second round. And you can't say it's about talent. You can't say it's about health of the people around him because they've been there. The injury issues have been with him for the most part. But even when he has been on the court, at the end of the day, if you're on the court, bro, like I have to like grade what I'm what I'm seeing. And I'm not seeing a guy right now that looks like on paper can get his team to the conference finals, bro. He's a. Uh... These foul baiting guys scare me, man. I don't know what, what it is about these foul baiting guys when it comes playoff time. Like they just kind of disappear. But I will say I'll defend and, and beat a little bit just because it is comparing Anthony Davis to Embiid 
which is tough because just the way I see it, Embiid is the number one. Anthony Davis, we already know, is the number two. And, and I mean, if we're talking about consistency and, like, showing up, Anthony Davis isn't the great at that <laughs> offensively either. So it's yeah, like look, both of those are very, tough. very fair points, and that has to go into it too. Yeah, because I can't be talking just about and be <laughs> not showing up in the playoffs and AD this past playoffs is that going like thirty points, ten points, forty points, right? 12 points, like, you know what I mean? And it's a lot. It's got to be fair both ways. And it's a lot easier to do that when you have your number one with you that can be consistent. Like, but I just watch old ass Braun score 40 and Anthony Davis is like you got it bro like he just didn't show up and we still get swept so it's like it's a little bit tough comparing a one to a two but yeah I mean Embiid we've talked about it plenty of times on this podcast man it's just like the fact that you know you're an MVP like you play at such this high level in the regular season and come postseason it just all that just disappears it's insane and it like the drop off is crazy. Like it goes from like averaging thirty three points to twenty three points. Like a ten point drop off composing mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Like there's no justifying that. It's ridiculous. And it's like the people that want to bring up injuries. That that's what do you want me to do? He he keeps getting injured. Like what do right. you want me to do? That's part of it. Jimmy was there. Like Ben physically was there <laughs> like for, a while, for a while. James Harden was there. It's like. Like I'm saying, bro, Jokic's teammates, the one time, the very first opportunity that he got healthy, that their whole team was healthy, they smoked the entire league and won the NBA championship. The first chance it happened, the first time that Compazzo wasn't his starting mm-hmm. point guard in the playoffs, and he got Jamal Murray and had AG and Michael Porter Jr. healthy, they win a championship. Those opportunities can't get squandered. Bro has had so much talent around him and has not even sniffed the conference finals yet. Yeah, bro. It's 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 not acceptable. And honestly, yeah, AD is the second option. But even when you go back to his last years when he was the guy in New Orleans, like he's never had the same kind yeah, no. of talent around him that mm-hmm. um, he did. Yeah, yeah, and those, and team, drop, his, his and those teams got that. just as far the second round of the playoffs. That part is true. Listen, I'm, I'm listen. This is music to my ears. I love AD, so like I ain't gonna, you ain't gonna get too much pushback from me. But and I, bro, I, bro, I still at this, I can say all this and still like, like Embiid. I yeah. think the foul ban goes too far, but. Bro, I you know how I used to play on 2K post player. <laughs> like I, I love watching people work out of the post. But at the same time, bro, like I have to be real. It cannot get, be regarded in the same echelon as these people. Again, when we're getting to this top player tier, like and you have the opportunity to have postseason success, and it continually doesn't happen when everything is in your favor. Like you have the team around you in a lot of these cases, you have the better matchup. You'll have yeah. the series lead. You're against a team that you're just clearly on paper better than it's happened too many times, bro. It's that, happened yeah. too many times that I say, that's the biggest thing too. Cause when you bring up the Anthony Davis Pelicans years, it's like he's was on the team that was supposed to lose regardless. And he was still playing well. Like, he, his drop offs was never as bad as Joel Embiid's. And it's like, even just looking at the games, like, when you watch Joel Embiid in the regular season, like, I'm looking at this guy like, wow, like, he really might be the best player in the league. And, like, just the way he plays, like, he doesn't look like that in the postseason. Even if the numbers end up being, like, oh, 30 and 10 this night. Like, it doesn't have that same impact. Like, he is dominating regular season games. I don't really feel that same way about postseason games, at least not on a consistent enough basis for the level of player that you are, being like an MVP, being supposed to be a top, what, three player in the league. Like, it, it just – it's not consistent enough. And the fact that, like you said, he's been on teams where they were supposed to win. Like, that series against the Hawks was like – there's no excuse for that, bro. I'm sorry. Like, you, y'all were supposed to beat that Hawks team. There's no way y'all lose to that Hawks team at all. Like, I get it. Ben Simmons was a big uh, big problem, but you're Joel Embiid, bro. Right. Like, you're supposed to be that guy. When we're getting to this tier of player, 
there are people who really just put the team on their back and they just get the job done. I right. watched Kawhi Leonard run through the whole NBA playoffs leading that Raptors team. I watched Dirk run through one of the toughest playoff runs in NBA history. His team wasn't slouches, but he ain't have no star with him. How many stars mm-hmm. has you played with? How many NBA 75 players has Embiid played with, bro, and has not made the conference finals? Like, come on. The bar isn't even championship at this point. It's literally the third round. It's finals, bro. <laughs> I need eight wins in the playoffs. That's it. Halfway there. That's all we're asking for, bro. Like, like I said, it's you have to get this nitpicky when we're talking about people at this level. Um, and with Embiid, like you said, in the regular season. He's gonna like he can anchor an elite defense and also put up the most points tonight in the NBA. Fantastic, bro. That's great. You got the MVP this year for it. I think it was deserved. Whether you other people do or don't, whatever. Like th- at worst, he's in the conversation to be a top three. He's an MVP finalist. And I, I can't imagine anybody having him lower than that. I think he deserved the MVP this year at the time before all the Kendrick Perkins wildness. Mm-hmm. I my issue, too, yeah. right? My issue lies with the postseason, and not just this past postseason. <laughs> All the postseasons, bro. Mm. Every single one of them. Um, so, because look, AD's like I said, his last season that he was fully healthy in New Orleans, he ended up getting bounced in five in the second round to KD Warrior team that ended up winning the championship that year. And then the next year was the year where he was like hurt towards the end of the year. The Pelicans weren't that good. And then he had to come back and play and still like not wanting to be on the team was putting up like 30 points a night. So it's like AD, like you said, has the talent. And that's part of why he was put over a guy like Bam because the ceiling, I think, is that much higher on the offensive side of the ball because you even saw it this past year. Um, in the series against Denver, like he was trying to go, he put up 40 against Jokic. It just wasn't enough, bro. Like, which that's all we'll say about Jokic. That speaks to Jokic, right? Like, (laughs) um, but the talent is there and defensively as good as, as Embiid is defensively, like AD is an all time defensive talent to ever play in the league. Um, just off of his, like you said, the rim protection and the versatility out of his his skill set to be switchable. Um, so I just, my, I'm I'm done with the rant on Embiid. We both got Embiid two and AD three. Y'all just know listening at home, it's two A two B. I don't even want to really <laughs> say it's two three because bro, Embiid is on thin ice. I like the at some point for the regular season has got to translate to postseason success. And it would be one thing if if, if every single series he was in, it's like we know we get from Embiid. He just can't get the guys around him. It's like, no, you got the people around you. Like, it can't happen this many times, and we always are pointing the blame at other people. Who can we pair with Embiid? Like, bro, right. if, it's, if it's happened, it's 2023. Like, this is starting from, like, 2018. We're, like, five, six playoff years deep now. Facts. We can't just the blame can't get, get keep getting put everywhere else but him. Like we've got to have that conversation, and that doesn't necessarily have to take away from his MVP season because the MVP is a regular season award. I don't like yeah, I don't like that part either. It's like bro, all these people was like yeah, give it to Embiid, give it to Embiid. They have a flame out in the postseason. He never deserved it in the first place. Like he can deserve it and then still flame out in the postseason. Right, like, truth, like that. But both of those things can be true. Right. So, AD3, uh, Embiid2, Jokic1, um, and that is it. We have now officially ranked all five positions. And what is that? The top the top player each position is what? Uh, Steph, D-Book at the two. We both had, I think, at Tatum at the three. Tatum. And then Giannis. Giannis, Giannis Jokic. Jokic. That team is disgusting. That team is gross. Next up. Top 10 head coaches in the NBA. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to do GMs, then owners, then mascot salesmen. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
let's go ahead then and, and transition and get off this Embiid rant really quick because we could do this for another hour, to be honest with you. Um, and let's talk about the NBA schedule release, um, which ha- came out, I think, last week, um, definitely since we last recorded. Um, on opening night, they've got two marquee matchups. The first game is um, the the Lakers at the Nuggets. Um, so a rematch of the Western Conference Finals and then the late game. They ass. It's Billy, it's up. I'm telling you. It's, it's, listen, we fresh now. We coming, bro. We're going to spoil their ring night. It's over. Yeah, that is the ring ceremony it's, night, too. Gonna spoil oh, their ring night. Because you know, they can't, bro, they can't do nothing without the Lakers involved. Because all I see is all, the, all this off season. Oh, my God. Remember the Lakers? Remember when we did this to the Lakers? That's all I see from Nuggets fans. Do y'all know y'all played the Heat in the finals? Why does the Lakers come up so much? Why? I just don't get it. Enjoy your championship <laughs> and just leave us alone. God damn. From a Nuggets fan perspective, they could say the same thing. Why are they talking? The Lakers was getting talked about when the Nuggets was in the finals. Like the Lakers did. Because we the Lakers. We just better. Than, we just more <laughs> lengthy, y'all. Like you can't get mad at us. Better or better Huh? Better, aura, better aura. That's just what it is. Like you can't be. Yeah, in Denver, bro. No disrespect. No disrespect. Chill, chill like, on Denver, bro. That's a lit city. I'm just. It's not bad. It ain't L.A. I, I'm just saying. L.A. price is crazy. I'm good. I ain't gonna lie. I'm gassing because I don't even like L.A. When I went to L.A., it was that's overrated. But LA I'm just saying, crazy. L.A. is overrated. I'm gonna be honest with you. Bro. Two thousand dollars get you a crib in Texas. Two thousand dollars get you a studio. Studio. Bear, yeah. <laughs> run down. Water don't work. Hole in the <laughs> ceiling. You don't got a window. <laughs> Yeah, but now we're gonna we're gonna we win in that night, bro. What's up? I'm telling you. I got 20 on Denver. I got 20. I bet locked. We <laughs> I locked. Got, I got we 20 locked. On Denver. We locked. Uh, and then the nightcap is the uh Warriors in Phoenix. Um uh, good one. <laughs> they not slick for putting CP against his old team opening night. He gonna start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking, is he gonna start? Hey. I ain't the coach. <laughs> that, that interview was too funny, bro. Man, that oh is, my that God. Is sick. Um, we already talked about the end season tournament a little bit, so we'll, we'll skip through that. But um, I'm excited for those matchups as well. Um, and then we do have – where's the Christmas Day games? Or let's do Rivals Week first, which they did last year. Um, and they have some good matchups, so they're bringing it back for the second season. Um, they have some of the, the obvious ones here. You got the battle for New York with the Knicks and the Nets, you got the battle for LA with the Lakers and the Clippers. Um, the Thunder and the Spurs are up here, which I'm assuming is just a Chet Wemby thing. I was about to um, say, what is that? But okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes I, I like that. I think that would be cool. Um, they had to have Suns ah. Mavs. Yeah. So I like that. Um, they got Celtics Heat, which makes sense. They always in the ECF. They got Kings Warriors. I like that too. Oof. They got Mavs Hawks, which I think people I saw were kind of confused Trey. at first, but like, yeah, should that make sense? Like Luca Trey, they're always going to be linked. Um, so that makes sense. I don't understand the Trailblazer Spurs one, other than I'm assuming it's a Scoot Wemby thing. But like, they're not really. I feel like we. I feel like they're reaching when how is in this entire rival week? How is there no? Lakers Celtics, the NBA rival, like the forget the NBA. That is like one of the best rivalries in sports. Period. Yeah. I don't know that that rivalry is kind of people. I don't know people don't really give talk about that rivalry anymore as much as they used to because it's like like you said like I mean obviously like we can see how they put it here like Lakers rival now just feels like the Clippers because the Clippers are like a better team now but like. Bro, any real Lakers fans would tell you, like, bro, that Lakers Celtics rivalry, like, yeah, it was, it was a bloodbath. Like every single time we played them, like right. it was up. But like now, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it holds that same weight. And you've got both. Like both of them are very good teams. Like it's not like one of them is bad or rebuilding or whatever. Like mm-hmm. Both of them are in championship contention. Like, I feel like it just made would have made sense to have that on there. But, again, like you said, the Clippers-Lakers rivalry makes sense. And then, obviously, they're going to always book Steph versus LeBron. Like, that's just 
I understand it from a ratings perspective. <laughs> like that's right. always going to draw more viewers, even though the Lakers Celtics rivalry may be bigger. Like that's just box office names. Um, they've got Sixers Nuggets up here for the Embiid Jokic. Good. <laughs> um, and then they got Heat Knicks up here as well. Uh, I'm excited for Rivals Week. I like what they did with it last year. I like some of these matchups they got. Some of them are team-based, which I like, and I like that they're running back the Kings-Warriors um, rematch from their series because their series was intense his last postseason. But I like that they did a lot of it based on player-specific. Like you got in right. Jokic, like we said, you got LeBron, Steph, Chet, Wemby, Wemby, Scoot. Um, so I, I like how they set it up. It, it, all of it makes sense. I just – I don't know the like traditional NBA fan in me wants to have seen Lakers Celtics. That just that is the NBA rivalry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know why they didn't do it, but it is what it is. Like I said, I don't know. Like no, we I don't see no Lakers fans that like hate the Celtics anymore. I don't see any Celtics fans that like hate the Lakers. Like when I like when I was growing up personally, like I hated the Celtics. I hate Paul Pierce to this day. And, like, the, and they met in the finals, like it, right. Like I hate him to this day. Like I like Rondo now because he helped us win a chip. But like Ray Allen, he cool. KG, I don't know. KG's whatever. Like <laughs> KG just be KG just be talking. So he's uh, he's in a whole different <laughs> boat. But like yeah, I did, I never liked the Celtics growing up. It is a little tough though because I do like Tatum now. So that will make it a little bit tough. But uh, yeah, like I said, that that rivalry just don't hold the same weight like it used to. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Maybe if they meet in the finals, it might, you know, rekindle some. Who knows? Yeah, it definitely would. The media, you know, is going to play it up like crazy if it happens. That would be battle for Banner 18, which would be the most in, what, most in, uh, in the NBA NBA history. Which Do bo- They both have 17 right now? Yeah. Which, side note, side note, the Celtics low-key be getting this name of, like, one of the greatest franchises, blah, 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 blah. They won all their rings in the 60s. Well, like As you said, Battle for 18, I'm like, so they both got 17. You tell me Bill Russell got 11 of them? <laughs> That's what I'm Before saying, bro. TV was in color? <laughs> bro, the Celtics get this, this, this brand of like, bro, we're this great historic franchise. Like That's what people be like, oh, my God, you're on the Celtics. Like, how can you guys not win a championship? They won one ring in the 2000s. Like, they, bro, they won their rings – in black and white when it was racism like what are we talking about like these the, bro they are a historic franchise but let's not act like these guys just win chips every year like they just do this all the time like bro they won one ring and that them that little bum ass big three that they had got talked up i swear like growing up i felt like that big three with uh with paul pierce kg and rondo like the way they was getting talked about i felt like they four peated like like they won mad rings they won one that's yeah. it and then, like, all the other rings was in the 60s. Like, this Celtics is – get them out of here, bro. Get them out of here. They're not one of the best franchises. I don't care what the rings say. They won all their rings when it was, like, eight teams in the league. <laughs> it's funny because I was – uh I was, like, the deep three did a top 30, like, all-time ranking, and they started, like, getting on, like, a Wilt versus Bill Russell <laughs> debate. And one of them had Wilt, like, super low, and he started going off about how it was, like, it was really only two centers that was good at the time, and it was obviously Wilt and Bill Russell. And mm-hmm. it was like, if Wilt is as good as people be saying he is, how did he let Bill Russell get <laughs> eleven <laughs> rings on his watch? Like, could you could you imagine if LeBron had the same stats? Somebody like was not putting up nowhere near the type of numbers as him, but won eleven rings <laughs> on LeBron's. Like, yo. NBA fans would not let him hear the end of it, but it's like That's we'll, true. we'll begin regarded in this like top ten conversation. Um, it's like, hey, bro, 11, 11 rings, bro. <laughs> I can't, I can't speak on it because I don't know. It's tough because like that them Celtics team had quote unquote like what like eleven Hall of Famers or like seven Hall of Famers up there, but like. Are they Hall of Famers just because they won, or were they actually good? Like, I don't know, because obviously we ain't. Hall, there's Hall of Famers at the time, but like you said, bro, it was not as many teams in the league. It's not that many players in the league. This was not some of these dudes' full-time jobs. Bro, I just, bro, honestly, that's why I don't, whenever I make a top 10 list or ever talking about, like, greatest players ever, I don't rank Will or Bill Russell. Not even out of, like, oh, they suck, but, like, 
How, what do you want me to do? I can't even rank basketball from the 60s. Like, that's so, it's so little to even go off of visually. It's not, it's literally not that much tape available. We don't have tape with a 100 point game, bro. That's what, like, that's what I'm saying. How could you, how could you genuinely make a correct list? You cannot even research it properly to make a correct list. And it's right. like, they're playing a whole different NBA. There's eight teams in the league. If there was the what eight teams in the NBA now, all the numbers, all the rings and everything would be complete. And beat automatically in the conference finals. <laughs> Probably not, but yeah. <laughs> he gotta be just off of numbers. <laughs> like he could be God. Imagine be. that he play a whole ten year career, never make it past the second <laughs> round. Eight teams. Eighteen. Nah, bro. He he ordered like a play, playoff star at the conference finals. You just gotta get there, bro. He missed the playoffs every year. <laughs> but uh, but like I'm just saying, like, bro, I can't rank these guys, bro. They played in a whole different NBA. I can't do it. Yeah. Um <laughs> this is a wild sidetrack. <laughs> um last thing I want to talk about with the schedule release is the number of national TV games. So the top five is the Warriors, and this is just with TNT, ESPN, and ABC. So I'm not counting NBA TV. Um, so Warriors have 29, Lakers have 28, Celtics have 26, Suns have 25, and the Nuggets have 22. So really no surprises there. Mm-hmm. And then there are, what is it, seven teams, uh, six teams with just one game nationally televised, and that's the Wizards, the Magic, the Pacers, the Rockets, the Pistons, and the Hornets, which is, that's kind of crazy. Like, those are all of the, like, young, up-and-coming teams, like, you can slide them a couple more. Like, I'm, I will say though, those are the teams that, because thinking about it, TV ratings are for like casuals too. Like, that is them true. on TV. And it's like, if you're a casual, like me, me and you are going to watch Rockets games. Right. Like, casuals probably not going to watch a Rockets game. It's a lot, bro. There's a lot of people that like Alperin Shingun could walk past them on the street. You can <laughs> tell them that's Alperin Shingun. They're right. Like, oh. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I do get it from the, from the business perspective. Um, so I, I got a question for you then based on that. So of those teams um, with the lowest amount of games, again, that's the Pistons, the Pacers, the Magic, the Raptors, the Rockets, and the Wizards, which team do you think you would be watching the most? And that's going to have to be like a league pass vibe. It's going to be either the Pacers or the Rockets, and it'd probably be – it'd probably be the – I'd probably be the Rockets. Mm-hmm. I'm genuinely because they have so many good, like they have so much things that I want to see. Like I want to see Jalen Green. I want to see if he can really develop into this star. I want to see Shingun. I like watching him play. I want to see Cam Whitmore. I want to see like it's, they have so many players, right. and I want to see the veterans. Can they mesh with the young guys? Ime Udoka's coaching. Like they, they have so many storylines. I didn't even mention them in Thompson. Like mm-hmm. they they got so much stuff going on. I think it's them, but I will say the Pacers is up there because I feel like they're going to be such a fast paced team. Mm-hmm be very fun to watch too so definitely between those two teams yeah i think to me it's between the pistons the pacers and the rockets and if i have to pick one i don't think i would probably pick the pick the rockets too but the pistons would be close for me because i really am excited to see Cade who with jalen Dern, um because they literally didn't get to do it last year because he was Mm -hmm. hurt for most of the season um i think they're going to be a nasty pick and roll duel uh, so I'm I'm excited to see that. And bro, K was giving the FIBA team work, giving them work. So I'm excited to see a healthy K coming here next year. Um, last bit of NBA news we got to talk about because the drama does not stop in Philly. Um, there is more that is unfolding in the the James Harden versus Daryl Morey saga. Um, the NBA is now again, launching an investigation into Harden's comments about what Daryl Morey lied about. I didn't even uh, know that. What? Yes. <laughs> um, and so and it sounds like James Harden told league investigators that he was referring to Daryl Morey telling James Harden that he would trade him, quote unquote, quickly following him opting in to his player option for this upcoming season. And so now that they're saying that they're going to keep him, he feels like um, he basically got screwed over by Daryl Morey because he probably wouldn't have opted into the deal had he not been told he was going to get traded, whatever. Which, honestly, 
at that point, then it kind of seems like you are looking out for the best interest of the 76ers because then you don't lose him for nothing because mm-hmm. he could have just walked. Thanks. So, again, this makes me feel like even more so I'm signing with Harden. Like, mm-hmm. he's trying to do y'all solid on top of the solid he did by even taking the, you know, the pay cut the first time. Um, and then <laughs> that came out today. A couple of days ago, James Harden, who's now back in America from his China trip, was training out at like some Houston high school and got an interview done by a, a Houston reporter who um, randomly was just like talking to him about the situation. Um, and the reporter asked him if he thought that the relationship was beyond repair. Harden said he thinks so. He said he's been patient all summer. And so at this point, he can just he feels like he just has to focus on what he can control and get ready for this season. Um, and on top of all of this, like I like, like you said, it's about to get ugly. And of all the people that you don't want to get into a standoff with, Harden may be like at the very bottom of that list. Facts. Um, he's even now hinted at talking about wanting to go play in China. So on the record is saying, every time I come to China, the love is crazy. You know what I mean? He said, so I feel like they deserve to actually see me come play here. The love is always crazy here. Now, obviously, literally due to the CBA, he cannot go play for the CBA, like the Chinese Basketball Association, while he is under this current contract with the Philadelphia 76ers. But he put all his chips to the center of the table. He's not backing down with not wanting to play for the Sixers ever again. Uh, so, <laughs> A, what do you think about the NBA's investigation into all this? And, B, what numbers would Harden put up in the Chinese Basketball Association? <laughs> well, he'd absolutely be – we talk about Will Chamberlain. He would be there, Will Chamberlain, as far as – Bro, dropping a hundred point games, <laughs> he would go no. out there and destroy them dudes, bro. But bro, Harden's not playing no damn China, bro. He's not. Like I respect it. I respect the the commitment to really not wanting to come back to the 76ers, but he's not. Even if even if he was allowed to, he would not play in China. I don't think. But um, maybe in like five six years, but like right when no, he's watched, no way, like, no way he's doing it now. That's just nah. he just added fuel mm-hmm. to the fire. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Maybe when he's like old and washed up, then maybe he'll go out there and hoop a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so y'all don't listen to what Kendrick Perkins said. I mean, y'all should know that by now, but like he out there on ESPN talking about he think Harden about to be out the league <laughs> at this Shut point, up. which is like, yeah, the guy that led the league in assists last year. Right. He's just, he's just out the league. Remember, Kendrick is just, he's just dumb. <clears throat> but, excuse me, as far as um the investigation, like I said, I didn't know they were doing this investigation. That was news to me. Um, but yeah, like every just everything that I've been hearing, everything that I've, I've been seeing with this whole Harden situation, it's like, like you said, it just seems like Harden really isn't that much in the wrong. Like it feels like Daryl Morey is the one who told him something, promised him something, mm-hmm. didn't commit to that promise, and now Harden is mad, rightfully so. Like All right. James Harden, I like I'd get it if James Harden just came to the team and like he was getting his money, he was just playing, like it was just normal. He came to the team. He took a pay cut. Like, he, he done sacrificed this, sacrificed that, like, balled in and tried to win. Like, James Harden, he's done his part to help the team. Um, Unfortunately, not in the playoffs. I mean, he had a couple of good games, but, I mean, he's James Harden. Like, he's going to have some dis- some disappearing acts. But as far as just doing everything off the court to help the team win a championship or at least get far in the playoffs, he's done that. He's giving money back to the organization to help them build a better team around him. He's done all that. And he was promised one thing. He didn't get it. Like, how mad can you really be at this guy? Like, he's literally fulfilled his side of his promises. And Daryl Morey just, at least allegedly, or what it seems like, hasn't filled his side. So I can definitely see why James Harden is upset. And now it seems like it's two separate things. Like, it seems like he took the pay cut, expecting the big contract, didn't get the contract, then was like, well, I can opt in so y'all can trade me right, right. and get something back. And then after he opted in, it was like, mm, not nah, never mind, you're on a contract. We're keeping you. Like you're dirty twice. Right. You're dirty twice, bro. Like, yeah. 
Yeah. And up right until now. recently, I think Harden represented himself like he was his agent. So I, I think he has one now, but like, hey, bro, you might need a new one. You get swindled right now. Bro. <laughs> getting, they are baiting you, bro. Nasty, bro. You're getting baited right now, buddy. So, yeah, I, I kind of feel bad, though, because it's like if you're trying to be a good guy and genuinely like do things in the betterment of the organization of the team and they're just like, you know what, let's screw him over. I do kind of feel bad, you know. What right, I mean? and it it's even crazier because like that was his boy. Yeah, like, like y'all were, bro. That was his guy since Houston. Like that's what makes it even worse. Like it's not like this is some random GM of a team he just went to. Like they're supposed to be boys. Like y'all supposed to be close. Like if mm -hmm. if anyone is not, if you think anyone anyone in the NBA or in the NBA organization is not gonna screw you over, if you're James Harden, it should be Daryl Morey. That that should be the one GM, the one guy right. that I know. I can go to and I can trust him to have my best interest at heart. And right. he just didn't. So did it's tough, him man. Dirty, bro. <sighs> tough, man. It's like tough. you said last time, bro, I could not imagine being a Sixers fan. We spent 20 minutes going off on Joel Embiid and then followed it up with <laughs> James Harden trade request drama. <laughs> they lucky that the Eagles got something brewing, bro, because it would be terrible. <laughs> They'd to be, be down a bad Philly in sports fan. They'd be down bad in Philly. Yeah. Um, we're gonna wrap up today's episode with something that we haven't done before. Hold on, hold on. Time out, time out. Just I'm just saying, just some breaking news. I don't know if you've seen it. I seen it when we were doing the uh the top 10 centers, just because mm -hmm. we were switching to football. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it popped up on my phone. The Colts have given permission for Jonathan Taylor to per to, to seek a trade. I was waiting until we was talking football to bring it up because you know I'm we could probably seeing it. we could probably talk about you know what I'm saying maybe destinations that he might go to. Hey, let's talk. Let's talk about it. Because live breaking news. Finally, I feel like every time this was this would have happened as soon as we stopped recording. Literally, as soon as we finish, boom, the request to trade or something like that. But now nah, I, I saw that pop in my phone. I was just like, okay, like this is this is interesting because. On Man, the they one hand, they could have had AR and JT. Yeah, That's let me. So sick. I'm gonna I'm say this now. The there, I, I fully understand the running back market. I fully get that it's not a position that you really want to give a lot of money to, especially long term. But if there's any situation that a guy should get paid at the running back spot, it mm -hmm. should be this one. You have a rookie quarterback who is a raw prospect at that, so he's not. He's gonna need some time. Maybe the best thing to give him is. Besides weapons and a good old line is a run game to fall back on so that he doesn't have all this all pressure right. on him. You're not paying him. You don't really have expectations to win. You have a running back who carried your offense two years ago. All pro. All, all pro. pro. One of the not best. Pro Bowl, all pro. <laughs> one of the best backs in the league. By the time his contract would be up, like that would be the time you would pay Anthony Richardson anyway if he ends up being your guy. So it's like and he's 24. So it's like you could give him, he, a, four yeah. year, give him a four year contract and he just like he's right now at the end of that going to be hitting that typical drop off point. And he for, might uh, not. Who knows? Like Derrick, Derrick Henry don't seem like he, he's it seems like he's past that point and he's still moving like he's not about to be 30, bro. Jonathan Taylor before this last year, they were they came out and they said Jonathan Taylor hasn't missed a practice ever in his career before. Like obviously this last year he got injured. Mm -hmm. Like I'm talking about high school, college, NFL. That's how you know you're practice. Like, you're bound for you're too good, like too much better than the people that you're playing against. That's no, true. Yeah, <laughs> you, can't, you can't even accidentally get hurt. Like, <laughs> just, it could it could not even gonna happen. You're just too good, bro. Right, but I'm like, so it's not like. You can use the excuse of, oh, this guy's been injured his whole career. Like the Saquon thing, like he got hurt a couple times. Right. He had these nagging injuries, had a couple big time injuries. Jonathan Taylor, that was his first year of his, basically his football life getting hurt. And now all of a sudden, I don't know, we can't pay him. He's he's a little bit injured. Like, come on, bro. This this whole, sa whole situation is kind of stupid. But then again, Nicole's owner is an idiot. So not really that surprised. He, but. bro, he just needs to stop talking. Like, I don't understand why as an owner, if you're going to do all that, bro, be Jerry Jones. Don't have a GM. Be the, be the GM. Mm -hmm. Like, you handle the decisions if you want to do that. But I would be 
tight if I was the head coach, director, player person, anybody in that front office. And it's like, this is happening because the owner is out here verbally talking about he doesn't want to pay Jonathan Taylor and getting into like multiple times over the past season. He just be saying stuff on Twitter or in interviews, like going against his own players. Mm hmm. Like car causing messes that are unnecessary, and then he's not responsible for cleaning up. That nope. then fall to, like right now, I'm about to fall to the GM to yield or to to hear all these trade or uh, trade offers from other teams. On a guy he probably wants to keep, <laughs> like he probably <laughs> would like to keep him. Man, yeah, I don't That's get it. Big. But what I what I will say ask you is, what do you feel like the best landing spot for him is if he was to get traded? I got like maybe two that makes sense. Um, maybe three. Me, Actually, maybe three. These teams. Maybe. <sighs> mm, hold on. Maybe four. I mean, it depends. Like, if I'm a team, like, nah, you can't. It, it like it. It it goes back to the market because a team like the Panthers, it would be like. You kind of got – hopefully got your quarterback of the future in Bryce Young. They just you paid go. Miles, too. Miles, right. they just paid him a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know who it would make sense for. Like, the, the teams I was, like, looking at, right, I'm thinking, all right, one, a team that doesn't have a guy that they're paying a lot of money to um, or just doesn't have a guy at the running back position in general. So, like – I was looking at a team like the Dolphins, maybe. Because, like, all their backs, they got Mostert. They're not paying yeah. him nothing. They got Wilson. They're not paying him nothing. A-Chain is a rookie. Like, he, they're not – he can't be a workhorse anyway. I seen Miami. That could be a possibility. You can mm -hmm. have a, a valid run game so then Tua doesn't have to throw the ball as much. Less opportunity to get hurt. Then, obviously, every time – I feel like every time a running back is on the market, a lot of people bring up the Chiefs just because, like, <laughs> they would nah. love to see a powerhouse offense like yeah. that. Which they would be just that offense would be if they're repeating it, they're coming, they're going back to back because that offense is ridiculous with John right. Taylor and then you got Patrick Mahomes. But then a couple interesting ones I've seen, I seen, I seen, I, I love, I thought of Chicago, but I don't know. I like Herbert already. Like if I'm Chicago, I don't know if I do that because I don't think you really need that. That was the next team I was thinking about, but then it goes back to like, you're trying to like build out your team and then you're going to pay a running back to where it's like, they're not going to be a contender for the next minimum, like two seasons to really make noise. Right. If you're lucky, I mean like next season, but even then it's like, are you really comfortable with giving out a big contract for like, then that like the windows don't overlap perfectly. Cause then it's mm -hmm. like, you're going to waste a year waste in the sense that like Jonathan Taylor is on a team that's not contending. Then, like, again, like, if you go back to the running back drop-off really happening at right after 27, then you have, like, two years of Jonathan Taylor on that contract. And it's like, it's, it's, are y'all really about to be a Super Bowl team that quick? Right. I don't think so. So it's like, maybe you should just wait until Justin Fields and that team is really there. And then, like, at that point, then you just draft somebody. Like, I mean, it's That's just like, it's yeah, tough. Because even then, running back don't tip the scale. Like, getting right. elite running back is, like, not the piece that like oh this is the missing piece of the Super Bowl like that's yeah that position is it's not tough. needed to win that's not yeah. really needed you don't need an elite running back to win the Super Bowl so that those are the only teams that made sense I think Miami just because like I said they don't really have a guy there like I like Moser like Wilson they're solid but they're not Jonathan Taylor they're not paying any of their backs um I, I yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. I was about to say the Bengals, but that doesn't make sense because they got to pay right. Earl, they got to pay Chase, they got to pay Higgins. They want to keep those guys together. All right, another team that could make sense, but again, like it makes sense on paper would be like the Vikings, but then it's like they just didn't want to pay Cook. Why are they going right. to pay Jonathan Taylor? Exactly. Maybe like, they're, they're clearly comfortable with letting it be Madison. So right, maybe Buffalo, the Bills, because mm. they matter of fact, hold on, because they were in the CMC sweepstakes, they wanted CMC. Mm -hmm. They've always talked about, yo, we don't want Josh Allen to have all this on his plate. Like, they don't want Josh Allen to be their running game and their passing game. Like, he's pretty much that entire offense. I, Damian Harris, we can forget about him. He, it is what it is. I like James Cook, but I don't know if he could be a workhorse anyway. And if you have a mm -hmm. running back tandem, JT and James Cook, now you have a legit 
elite running game, along with having Stephon Diggs on the outside and Josh Allen's your QB. Hey, and it came out today that you know Stephen A. Smith got the sources. He said that oh Stephon, he said Diggs wants out. Maybe that keeps Diggs happy. It, it might because then they I actually because right now I think a lot of people think that the Bills window is closing a little bit just because they had they missed a lot of opportunities these past couple years. But you get Jonathan Taylor, you have a, a legit running game. Your defense is still good, good to great. You got Josh Allen, one of the best QBs in the league. I, I like the Buffalo fit a lot. I'm not going to lie. That that I think is the one that makes the most sense on paper and with their actual situation. Right. Yeah, yeah that or, or Miami. Those two I think make the most sense. For everybody involved, like JT goes somewhere where they're contending, like at least trying to contend. Mm-hmm. There's a need there. I honestly think from a scheme perspective, he may fit better in uh, Miami just with Mike McDaniel coming out yeah. of the Shanahan tree. Like I think he really would get crafty with the play calling, but I think the fit would be good there in Buffalo too because then it gives – it just opens up a new lens lens for that offense where it's like you know, people were not as concerned for Devin Singletary, but it would be a whole different story if that was Jonathan Taylor back there. 100% it helps open up the passing game. Like mm-hmm. you're, you're more versatile, and it's not just the Josh Allen show anymore, So, which is good for his health, which is good for just mm-hmm. not being as predictable. Like, I know, I like that a lot. They, they get JT, they're – I I wouldn't I don't know if I just flat out say favorites, but top two three in the league right now is as far as like Super Bowl odds. Yeah, no, I I agree. So, Bills, Dolphins, both make a ton of sense. Now I don't know, bro. You, you would you draft him in fantasy right now? A draft coming up, so like right now, hell no, not it's a no. bad time. It's like, no, it is a horrible time. I got drafts coming up in a week or two. Right, right, right now, the way it is, even if even if he's like, you know, what, I'm playing on the Colts. I don't. I'm straight. It's too much bad vibes. I try to avoid right. bad vibes, bro. I'm good. I would be tight if I drafted him like last week, and now it's like he's, <laughs> he's not gonna play for the Colts. He's just gonna right. hold out. He's like. <laughs> That was my that was my second round pick, bro. <laughs> right. That's why. Listen, that's why you gotta avoid avoid bad vibes at all costs, bro. I'm straight. Bad vibes could get you, bro. That could get you anywhere in life if you just avoid bad vibes. That's facts. That's a life lesson, right there. Right, we, bro. Gems. We giving y'all wisdom. This is, <laughs> this is, this is deeper than basketball. It's deeper than football. This is real life <laughs> advice. Avoid the bad vibes. <laughs> I'm dead. Um. Okay. So to wrap up today's episode. We're going to be doing some blind NFL player rankings. So I have three different sets here. The first two are current players. First one is going to be current quarterbacks. The second one is going to be current wide receivers. And the last one, a little random, but we're going to do Hall of Fame DBs. Okay. Um, And so I have them. I, I literally just wrote them out as I thought them up. So how I'm reading it to you is how you're going to have them, but you have to put them in order one through five, not knowing who's about to come next on the list. I so bet. <laughs> got to be strategic with this. Bet, bet, um, bet. All right, so let's start off. Let's blind rank these current NFL quarterbacks. The first one I have is Jared Goff. Okay. One through five. One through five. I think... We, we're definitely going to get somebody worse. Are we going to get two people worse? That's the question. That's what mm. you got to you gotta, you gotta go with your gut. I'll go three. Three? I'll I go three. I'll three. I think I could even – I can convince my way to convince him better than somebody else. So I can Okay. The next guy I got, Jalen Hurts. Two. Two. I'm going to I'm I'm go, go two. I'm gonna go okay. two. I, yeah, I'm gonna go two. I'm gonna go two. I'm gonna go two. Next guy I got Jimmy Garoppolo. I'm gonna go four. I think we can get somebody. I think you got a bum up there. I think you put. I think you put somebody that stinks up there. So I'm gonna go four. <laughs> Next guy I got Joe Burrow. Okay, we good. I got one. I got one. And right. I can put Mahomes. I'm be tight. Yeah, that'll be that'll be dirty. <laughs> yeah. But the right, question so. is, is this next person 
worse than Jimmy G because the last guy, Jacoby Brissett. Yeah, he worse than Jimmy G. I think I, I snapped on yeah, that you one. Yeah, okay. you got crazy. I snapped okay. on that one. Okay, okay, okay. I like this. All right, next one. We're going to blind rank current NFL wide receivers. The first one, A.J. Brown. Damn. Okay. We starting off hot. Okay. Okay. You. De- I think you got somebody better than A.J. Brown up there. But it's mm-hmm. not a lot of people better than AJ Brown. I'm gonna yeah. go to two. Okay, I'm gonna go to. I'm gonna go to. Next up, I got your boy, NFL young boy George Pickens. George Pickens, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go four. I'm. Gonna, I'm not trying four, to be biased. Five. I'm gonna go four. Next one I got is Terry McLaurin. Okay, he's perfect for that three spot. He's better than Pickens. I think AJ's better. I, I'll go three. I think he's three. Okay, okay. Next one I got Chase Claypool. He's five. He stinks. Yeah, he's five. He's five. He's worse than he's definitely worse than Pickens. He's definitely worse than Pickens. I agree. I just need I need this. Listen, come on, Jamar Chase, Jettas, Tay. I need somebody at number one. At number five. I got Christian Watson. Damn. I'm just joking. Oh, I'm just joking. Okay, I'm just joking. Okay. It's Devontae Adams. <laughs> oh, yeah, we are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going crazy. Oh, uh, that would have been grimy if I switched it on the fly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I, know my, right. I know my rankings, Billy. I know my rankings. This last one, I mean, it's, you can't even really go wrong, but I just want to see how you would put these people in order because I, I didn't even, like, attempt to rank them. I literally just was like, Who's some Hall of Fame DBs? Maybe put a list of five. Man. So let's blind rank these five Hall of Fame defensive backs, starting with this year's Hall of Fame enshrinee, Darrell Revis. The question is, do you have Dion up here? That's the real question, because Darrell know. Revis could be one. This is all DBs, corners and safeties. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> take a second. Think about Whoa. that. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I'll put him two then. I'll put Darrell Revis too because he's up there. Okay, okay. You might have like a Dion or uh, my bias might see Troy Palomalu up there. I might That's put him at one. Number two is Troy Palomalu. I'm putting him at one just for my bias. one. I don't wow, care. I don't two care. and I don't one care. knocked out in the first two. Now, games. Now, now, hold on. Let me think. Let me think. All right, I gotta put the bias down. I gotta. Put the Steelers fan aside. Put the Steelers fan aside. I will put him three. Damn, I'll put him three. I'll put him three. Because I think Revis could have a case of being the best corner ever. I don't think Palomaro has the case of being the best strong safety ever. He's up there. I don't think he's, like, the best. Yeah. So the next player I got for you is Champ Bailey. i put him – I guess I'll put him four. Four. I guess I, I – guess I, yeah, I mean, it's, either way, he's gonna feel somebody. Gonna yeah, be yeah, I'm gonna say somebody gonna, gonna be tough. So I just, I'll put him four. I'll put him four. I mean, I okay. probably should put him five, but it is what it is. All right, next up, I got Dion. One. Okay, One. we good. Are we good? Because Dion's so the, the best la- corner ever. The last spot five, right? Yeah. Oh, shit. Last Who's guy I got Ed Reed. Oh my God, I folded. <laughs> I folded the last one, man. Damn, I know I should have put Chad Bailey five. Damn. It's tough. Nah, it's t- the it blind is- rank is that when everybody is that good, it's like it's tough. Yeah, it's it's so hard because like the, the yeah, it's so hard. Everybody is elite. Everybody's at Hall of Fame level. Yeah, it's tough. That was that was fun. Though. I like that. No, that was just fun though. We're gonna come back with those with some more yeah. positions because those that was, was- a that was three videos right there. First OD. of all, mad <laughs> quick. <laughs> oh, mad quick. Um, dang, bro, the NBA season gotta hurry up, or yeah. not even, bro. The FIBA FIBA tournament need to hurry up. Yeah, I mean, sure. I actually look. I feel like it's was it next week it starts. What's the name, my boy? Listen, my breakout player is hooping, man. My breakout guy is going crazy, like he should, like predicted on the Off the Glass podcast. To to wrap up the show, bro, talk to the people about about your boy Austin Reeves, bro. Austin Reeves, first of all, needs to stop getting disrespected and act like he's just this Lakers guy that gets this unnecessary hype. Austin Reeves. Is actually a good basketball player. If y'all take the time to actually watch and stop hating, this man is a is a good combo guard, bro. He could play with anybody. He could shoot. He could create his own shot. He could run the point. He could run the pick and roll. Get people involved. Unselfish. Good passer. 
Come on, man. Austin Reed. Everybody, every team needs an Austin Reed, bro. So he's perfect for the feed, but he he don't got no ego. He going to help the stars out. He going to come off the bench. He going to get some buckets. And he going to play defense. Mm-hmm. And he going to play defense. Come on, bro. No ego, but got the best white boy aura since Larry Bird confirmed. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. And y'all over here hating on my boy because he got a, the purple and gold on, bro. Stop hating, bro. Austin Reed is that guy. He's him. One of these days, you're going to do an aura draft, bro. <laughs> 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 An aura draft. I'm dead. <laughs> Let's draft a certain lineup based off aura. <laughs> oh, aura. <laughs> I'm, fucking, I'm dead. Oh my god. They need to add that. That needs to be a, a gonna attribute be a, in 2K. <laughs> I'm about to say, that's gonna be a badge. <laughs> he got Hall of Fame aura. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. man. Yeah. Last year, and it's what well, this. About to be the last week of the preseason. I feel like the preseason flew by, bro. Thanks, bro. I mean, season start was September 7th, off the yeah. top of my head. Yeah. 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 Season August has been kind of flying, bro. I'm not going to lie. August always feel like it drags because that's the month right before football start. But mm-hmm. August, August been flying, bro. You got to zoom in. Yeah. So August definitely been flying. I'm ready, it's- man. I'm ready for this fantasy football draft, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm locked. Not- I'm Listen. watching the, the dynasty videos. I'm, I got my game plan already, you know. Bro, bro, hold get a hold spreadsheet on. going. Let's, bro. I'm here with it. I'm, Yo, I'm, got I'm the here notepad. with it. I got the, I'm here, bro. I'm here with it, bro. I know who I'm drafting. I got him. I don't know if you can see him. I got him the tiered out right here. You can see the brackets. You can see where the brick off. You know what I'm saying? These are my. You see what they got to do to stop me from getting a three P, bro? I got people. Moving, bro. People going crazy. We got note takers now. This I right. thought it was just fantasy. I thought this was just a game. This is a lifestyle. It's no, it's up. I'm winning, bro. I'm coming home with at least two chips this year. Out of all I'm my letting league. y'all. I'm letting y'all know right now. If I not, forget the three P, if I win the dynasty this year and the redraft, the very first episode of this podcast. I'm pulling up with two WWE championship belts around my shoulders, and I'm cutting a 10-minute promo. I'm going to have theme music. Gonna, I'm going full nine on the editing. It's going to be like, for real, for real, Monday Night Raw. Bro, I'm not going to lie. If you win both, uh, you you earn doing it. At that point, you got it. You earned it, bro. Yeah, <laughs> damn. We cannot. We can't give it up like that. I'm sorry. I'm coming. I got to come home with one. I got to. It's only right. No, nah, yeah, I don't I'm even good. know if I'm going to go for the – because it feels like if you go for the win now in Dynasty, you really handicapping yourself later. Like, it just doesn't make more sense to try to, like, have a balanced team. But then again, it's like – yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why you – honestly, the what I've been seeing people just go based off of what happens in a draft. Not everyone does an auction, so it's a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. But, like, say, like – all right, say you're doing, like, a regular draft, like a snake draft, right? And you end up fifth round in, like – Devonte Adams is there. It's like I might as well go for it now. You know right. what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's kind of just the way the draft falls a little bit. So I don't know. It's a little bit tough. Auction is different though because you could genuinely like I'm going for the win now or I'm rebuilding. You could just choose which one. I got an elite auction strategy. Y'all not ready, bro. Y'all not ready. Bro, everybody, bro. everybody in the league, y'all about to get finesse so hard, bro. Y'all not I, ready. Listen. I ain't gonna say nothing. You know, I ain't gonna say that. Draft is in what six days? Six days. Six days. We'll come back and we'll show our teams on the pod. We gotta be right. like, we go, that's we gonna see. that's gonna be a short right there. We right, gonna right, put right. both our teams team. up. Y'all let us know who drafted the better fantasy team. <laughs> Two video <laughs> dynasty and redraft. That's how facts. you get all the content. <laughs> facts, facts, facts. Uh, Man, that's gonna do it. That's gonna do it for today's episode of the Off the Glass Podcast. You made it all the way through the episode. We appreciate you as always. If you're on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Um, if you're on audio platforms, five star review or five star rating, drop a review, pre download the show. It helps us out a ton. We appreciate you as always. Um, as we're moving forward, we're probably the next episode might be a full NFL episode. Um, and then we'll probably get into more uh, like NBA full season previews as we get into September um, and the preseason starts to come around early October. So just giving y'all a heads up for that. But we appreciate the support as always. I'm Billy, that's Dame, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.